Monster Hunter is about hunting monsters. Unanimously, every Monster Hunter fan has encountered this situation with a non-Monster Hunter fan, where you're confronted with that question, uh, what is Monster Hunter about? And the answer is always, well, it's about hunting monsters, which is always funny because the person you were talking to was likely expecting a more extravagant answer. The follow-up statement is usually an explanation of the gameplay loop, I'm not going to repeat it here, but in the heart of every Monster Hunter fan, you know it's not that simple. It's not just the gameplay loop that keeps you hooked. Unfortunately, I've spent most of my life analyzing the art direction of Monster Hunter, for better or for worse, and usually comparing it to the gameplay loop, and I wrestle with the question, what is Monster Hunter about? This video is a collection of my thoughts to provide a strong and meaningful answer to what hunting monsters is representative of. While it's not my intention, I will inevitably filter out individuals that find no meaning in Monster Hunter, but I hope that the uninitiated stay to hear my alternative perspectives on this series. Furthermore, my findings exist whether or not the producers of this franchise intended me to interpret their games this way. I'm going to first describe the core design philosophy of Monster Hunter, then I'm going to highlight how humanity is portrayed in these games, and then I'm going to highlight how animals are portrayed in these games, and in doing so I'll illustrate the confrontational relationship between humanity and the animals, which is what Monster Hunter is about. It's about hunting monsters. When I say I'm going to explain what Monster Hunter is about, this does not mean dissecting the plot narrative of each respective game. I already have an analysis on what Monster Hunter's story really is, that's in a separate video, and I think that video complements this one very well, and I implore all of you to watch that one first. Or after, whatever you choose. I'm also not going to use this video to just elaborate on Monster Hunter's lore, because I find Monster Hunter's lore unreliable. That being said, I believe that the unreliable lore is a major strength to the series and that we are supposed to fill in the gaps with answers found in our own reality. I think that this is the crux of Monster Hunter's world design, and so rather, through this video, I'll be talking about my interpretation of how the gameplay and game aesthetics fuse to create a worthwhile piece of art, and explore what Monster Hunter is revealing about human culture and human nature. Now for this next section, if you've seen Ratatosker's video on different types of Monster Hunter fans, I'll be repeating myself a bit here, because I'm using some of the same evidence I used when writing that video. The reason why I'm doing this, just like in Ratatosker's video, I need to make it abundantly clear that Monster Hunter requires fantastical ecology in order for the game world to function, and for the game world to be interesting and unique. In the book, Monster Hunter Illustrations 1, it includes translated interviews with the development team. I'm going to be using what's translated in the book but I know that they're 100% they're accurate. They described that the birth of the series Monster Hunter was from the concept of having an online action game where multiple players team up and defeat enemy monsters. Monster Hunter, at its core, is about hunting monsters. That is the primary gameplay loop. Everything centers around the dynamic between the enemy monster and the player character. Without this, the game is not Monster Hunter. The interviews continue, and they discuss that during the early development of the original Monster Hunter, they shifted from a typical fantasy setting into a more grounded setting, with ecologically conscious explanations to the more fantastical aspects within the game world. We had it in our heads that this was going to be a fantasy game, so our ideas tended to gear around magic and the like. The world as a whole was much more fantastical as well. I doubt any of us expected it to turn out so analog. When we got down to the nitty gritty of what kind of game is Monster Hunter going to be, really, that was when we dropped the whole magic system. One of the earliest concept movies we created showed a few hunters laying traps and luring a monster to their traps. In those movies, the monsters were also very generic fantasy monsters, like red dragons. Not only were they archetypical dragons, we also had them climbing out of depths of ancient ruins where they had no doubt been napping on a huge treasure hoard. So the game itself didn't have a strong connection to nature at first. This shift in development became, what I believe, is their greatest asset, and it forged the Monster Hunter game world as we know it today. This unique setting allowed Monster Hunter to stand out next to other fantasy game worlds. The world of Monster Hunter is a fantasy world, but the player characters do not have magic, though they are still at odds with fantastical enemy monsters like a typical fantasy game. As we can see in the final finished game, these fantastical enemy monsters aren't portrayed as magical either. 
rather they behave like real-life animals. Ecologically conscious fantasy is one of the biggest talking points of the series, and to a large portion of the Monster Hunter community, this fantastical ecology is the very essence of the franchise. To summarize Capcom's design philosophy, in my words, fantastical ecology, the monsters, is the core of the gameplay loop, hunting them. To make the monsters more interesting, different from typical monsters in other franchises, the developers focused on making the monsters have biological features and ecological behaviors, both of which are inspired by ecological dynamics we see in our real world. In turn, these details that are based off ecological behaviors and dynamics are integrated back into the gameplay loop. The monsters will use their specially designed body parts in combat, and we also see that their habits to survive in this ecosystem also affect their overall survivability against the player hunter. So they go hand in hand. The fantastical ecology is what makes the monster. Looking into the design of practically every monster in the series, we can see that the developers deliberately chose designs that made practical sense in a simulated ecological setting. Every monster has a bunch of ideas incorporated into each part of its design in order to give the player a better sense of how it lives within the game world. For instance, the hard looking skin on Legombi's arms were designed to help it break and change course while gliding, in addition to being resistant to damage. It would make me happy if players have fun wondering why the monster's various parts are designed the way that they are while actually playing the game. For the Monster titles, I try to capture a sense of living creatures in the designs. That's the theme I follow. I take into consideration not just the thought of making them look cool, but also their dignity as wild creatures, and elements that would facilitate play as a game. Using Baroth as an example, the monster was designed entirely around its relationship with the local environment. It uses murky, muddy waters to hide from other creatures, but it also uses the mud to protect itself from the heat of the sun. Capcom even provides a pre-rendered cutscene of Baroth's behaviors outside of the limitations of the game engine. In the Baroth Ecology video, we can see the developer's vision of this fictional animal. These concepts then translate to gameplay. The behaviors that assist Baroth in survival suddenly become combat gimmicks in the player's battle against the monster. Now the mud is protecting the Baroth from the hunter as well. For Baroth's design, I thought of a bulldozer clearing away sand and dirt and combined it with the motif of a caterpillar's carapace. It was decided that the creature lives in bogs, so I figured that it would approach its prey covered in dirt and mud to hide its body. That's when I put the nostrils on the top of its head so that it could still breathe even when it's submerged in mud. The gameplay loop does not stop at simply hunting the monsters, rather Monster Hunter's gameplay loop incorporates and embraces the simulated environments and the interactions between the fictional animals on screen, all coming together as a holistically unique gameplay experience that no other franchise has successfully replicated to this level. Monster Hunter World doubled down on the simulated ecosystem angle, and the developers pushed to take this concept to a new level never before seen in the series. The book, Monster Hunter World, The Complete Design Works, explains the developers' intentions very clearly. As with all life in the fields, we begin by thinking about what would be at the bottom of the food chain in the environment. For example, the environments in the ancient forests differ depending on the location, which determines the humidity, temperature, and sunlight. The higher the elevation, the lower the humidity and more wind. Areas of high humidity would have moss and fungi. What would inhabit an environment like that? We would start there and slowly add Monster Hunter World's original touches. How would monsters behave? How would they interact with the landscape? We would start at the bottom of the food chain and then work our way to the top. We experimented using the ancient forest as a template. Monsunder was originally designed to become more difficult as you go deeper into the fields. We did not want to change that. We experimented with ways to retain that concept while having numerous camps and ecosystems in the field. In the first area outside the first camp, you will find herbivorous monsters like the Aptonoths, some Anginaps if you go deeper, and then Rathalos even farther in. The habitat was designed to mimic a food chain with the Rathalos at the top of it. The game design also reflects natural humidity, Fujioko suggested including. As a result, you'll find stronger monsters as the environment branches off from lower to higher humidity. Exploring the game with the ecosystem in mind heightens the player's sense of searching and exploring. Every single aspect of this game world is built around a simulated ecosystem, ecosystems that are fictional, but they're based off our real life ecosystems. In a 2017 interview on Monster Hunter World's design direction, Ryozo Sujimoto said, Everything kind of flows from the concept we have from the title. We don't make changes at random. We don't just decide let's make it easier, and then pick things to change it. It's more that once you've decided a new concept for the next title, which in this case is a living, breathing ecosystem full of rich interactions between predator and prey monsters and little creatures, the hunters are jumping into this world, but even without you, it's kind of on its own business being a realistic ecosystem. 
There are many design books where the developers in Monster Hunter discuss the process of coming up with a monster, mixing in the ecological details, and ultimately producing a creature that is interesting to learn about and entertaining to fight. Most of the monster's lore regarding its ecological habits are revealed through talking points in the game or extra-canonical materials like monster encyclopedias. This process of creating ecologically conscious monsters leads to an entertaining and interesting game, simple as. Yes, they are fantastical monsters, but they are inspired by our real-world animals and environments. That's what makes Monster Hunter's setting so fresh and unique. It's about players hunting fantastical animals. With this understanding, we can begin my analysis properly. The next two sections cover the subjects of humanity and monsters. In my findings, I've come to the conclusion that the player character represents humanity, and the enemy monsters represent nature. That while they put lots of emphasis and focus on these monsters that take influence from our real-world ecology, I believe that humanity in these games also take influence from our real-world society. How many of you have played Monster Hunter 1? Because I know, truthfully, not everyone has. More people have played the newer games, and that's okay. In that case, have you at least listened to the music from Monster Hunter 1? Most fans will probably cite the main theme, which is proof of a hero. I think most people consider proof of a hero to be the main theme of Monster Hunter 1. It is heroic and cinematic. It's a typical brass and strings orchestra. The Forest and Hills battle music is infamous, many calling it bland and repetitive. You also might mention the Kokoto Village theme, if we're on the topic of Monster Hunter 1 music, which uses stereotypical medieval European instrumentation. All three of these songs have become mimetic in the community, and they're all synonymous with Generation 1. All three of these songs are featured as motifs, as nostalgic callbacks, in the fight against the Fatalis in Monster Hunter World. Now, for those who have actually played Monster Hunter 1, then you know that these three songs aren't really representative of what the whole game is. Actually, most of the game is a weird and organically raw ambient soundscape. The environments had quiet instruments complementing the environmental sounds. The tavern music is a mix of Foley and Walla recordings of people talking and eating layered over what sounds like a diegetic performance. The whole space sounds like it's happening in real time to the hunters in the tavern. When the music ends, the people's voices pick back up before being silenced again with a new performance. These performances are some of the most raw and genuine sounding tracks in all of Monster Hunter's music library, and I believe it was intended to be diegetic music. If you're a player that started with one of the newer titles, like World Arise, then a song like Lone Wolf doesn't match your perception of Monster Hunter's musical direction at all. It's just one guy performing on a guitar. There are no dramatic motifs. Monster Hunter 1 was a moody game. By using this diegetic sound direction, Monster Hunter is stylistically blurring the line between fantasy and reality. Through my analysis, you'll see that I firmly believe that Monster Hunter is a reflection of our real world on all levels, and it's exploring this through imaginative ecology with fantasy elements. I believe that the diegetic performances, and the diegetic sound in general, reinforces the feeling that this place could be real, that these adventures the player are having could be real, even if they clearly aren't. They establish this space, this world, as a grounded city with grounded people, comparatively to other contemporary JRPGs, which usually have magical characters and bright expressive locations, Mindguard is gritty and mundane. The characters are mostly normal humans eating, drinking, socializing. With humans portrayed as leaning aesthetically closer to real-life historical cultures, Monster Hunter leaves room for the fantasy to be holistically the monsters. 
Remember, with the exception of the other humanoid races like Wyvarians, the fantasy elements are always entirely tied to the monsters. The hunter's technology was all created in response to the monsters. Everything that you have is made from the monster's fantastical body parts, or made in response to defending yourself from the monster. Monster Hunter's fantasy is the monsters, the legendary creatures that the hunters track and eliminate. So if you remove the monsters from Monster Hunter, the game's world and culture is completely undone. Suddenly, it is essentially an alternative Earth set in a vaguely Middle Ages time frame. If you exchange the fantastical ecology with our real world ecology, I would argue that you just get our real life. The moment you swap the fantastical ecology with our real world ecology, who's to say that the Monster Hunter world is not just our world? There was a time in our human history where dangerous animals were something we truly feared, and thus our understanding of them was spotty. These days, we're so used to them being cute in our nature documentaries that we've lost that mysterious and dramatic edge that animals had over us thousands of years ago. If you look into some of the earliest real-life examples of humans cataloging Earth animals or attempting to form any sort of you know, encyclopedia of animals, they used to have the habit to list animals that simply didn't exist, like dragons, unicorns, manticores, minotaurs, leviathans, etc., which notably are all animals that do exist in Monster Hunter. These mythical creatures were included in these old texts because, at the time, the quality of life in general was lower than it is now, so it's far more difficult and dangerous to prove that they don't actually exist. Uh, people just believed they were real, and it was easier to misinterpret a real, normal animal for a fantastical one when you're just going on eyewitness reports. It's easy to mix up a rhinoceros with a monoceros and then think the monoceros is the fantastical unicorn. Monster Hunter is about facing mythical creatures that don't exist in our world, but they do in Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter is the story of actually facing a unicorn, or a dragon, or some kind of cryptid, or any sort of mythical creature. Monster Hunter is about hunting monsters. It's about humanity's relationship with these monsters. At the very core of Monster Hunter's theming and narrative is simply, how would humanity function if all the mythical creatures of our culture and history were actually real? How different would our society be if dragons were real? Monster Hunter is the answer to that. I mean, what's so deadly about a wee bit of crab fishing? Are they trapping giant sea beasties with deadly venomous fangs? or electric fire-breathing creatures with razor blade claws! No! If you really want to hunt for something deadly, then take a whack at these remarkable creatures! They're all found in the most immense, gorgeous, and hidden places you've ever seen! You wanna know where? Africa? South America? No! These amazing hunting grounds can only be found on the Wii! In life, they're hunters. And then, they're monster hunters! And then there's wee little babies crying for their mall! <laughs> The world of Monster Hunter is set at a critical time in human progress where they are finally starting to establish what we consider modern zoology. But because the animals in the world of Monster Hunter are these fictional mythical creatures, they have always been far more dangerous to humankind than what we've seen in our real world against real animals. Obviously, this has caused major roadblocks for humanity, and humans are still resorting to their tried and true methods of survival. Kill first, ask questions later. Through the story of Monster Hunter World, it's clear that the ecologists of the different fleets have no possible way of properly studying these animals because it's simply too dangerous. And the only viable method is to send a highly skilled hunter to take down the animal first. And this is all well and good, but the characters are all confused with themselves and also tell the player that this slaying of animals is good for the well-being of the greater environment. In reality, the hunting process is only a benefit to humanity, not the greater environment. With or without human involvement, the environment exists as it always has. Truthfully, what you're doing in Monster Hunter World is what I consider flawed ecological study, but it's human nature to never admit that you're wrong. I would be much happier if this series in some way acknowledged the negative impacts of human involvement in this conversation instead of painting the whole thing as doing the right thing, but also I think that that might be the point of Monster Hunter, is to show the hubris of man. With all of that acknowledged, we soon see that the monsters in Monster Hunter are truly animals, 
but they're just deemed monsters because that's how the people have always viewed these creatures, as monsters that cause issues for human development. Now, while humanity came from animals, we have traits that distinctly separate us from animals. When animals are uncomfortable with their environment, they move to a different location that would ideally, hopefully, provide the necessary resources for them to survive, or natural selection takes place. Humans, on the other hand, will instead go through great lengths to modify our local environment when we are uncomfortable. Humans can live practically anywhere on this planet. We have no issue in transforming any local environment into the necessary resources we need to survive. Even when we've achieved a level of comfort beyond any animal on this planet, transforming the local landscape into a utopian environment where we don't have to forage for food and the weather cannot affect our homes, we would still become uncomfortable in some way and will continue to manipulate the things around us to make it better for ourselves, whether it being campaigning against local governments or even manipulating the interpersonal relationships that are closest to you. It's all in an effort to make your life easier and to make you more comfortable. Human Humans are constantly pursuing the goal of comfort because we are constantly unhappy. But no other animal on this planet has the luxury to do that, or even wants to do that, and especially not on the scale that we do. In my personal beliefs, when humans are described as beings made in the image of God, I relate it directly to our desire to reshape the world around us. Humans desire to be our own God. We want supreme control over the universe. We want to make our lives more comfortable. In Monster Hunter, humanity is struggling to gain that same control over the Earth because the Earth is 1,000 times more hostile. In my eyes, the myth of Monster Hunter is the lesson of humanity attempting to conquer chaos and failing. The game's locales are primordial and apocalyptic, but when I say apocalyptic, I don't mean like end-of-the-world apocalyptic. I mean aesthetically they resemble really old Mesozoic art, which depicts planet Earth as a hostile, dangerous planet with savage beasts, turbulent weather, and volcanic explosions. A lot of the people that was making making these arts at the time based it off of, you know, early primordial Earth uh, that would have been depicted in, like, that would have been discussed in biblical depictions of the Earth, which is why old dinosaur art looks looks so insane. But that's how it looks in Monster Hunter. It's this raw depiction of humanity against an untamable nature. I believe this is the key art direction of Monster Hunter. I've said it many times, the song Ancient Rhythm is my personal favorite Monster Hunter soundtrack of all time. Many of the older Monster Hunter tracks rely on culturally diverse instrument choices and unique tones, which I believe speak of a culture, a history. Monster Hunter has its own culture and histories, but it doesn't quite tell us exactly what they are, other than they faced monsters and struggled. These are chaotic, untamable lands, yet across all the locales, the player finds signs of civilization, destroyed ruins. Humans have attempted time and time again to claim these lands as their own, but have been destroyed over and over. The music reflects this too. There is a sadness and a fear in a lot of these early tracks. They're asking the player, can you overcome chaos, or will you succumb to chaos and the monsters like all the ruins around you? Monster Hunter is that struggle. We're hunting monsters in our pursuit for utopia. Monster Hunter will set the player up in a human setting, a, usually a familiar setting, a, a village. The first animals Monster Hunter shows the player, aside from the opening cinematic, were typically very normal Earth animals. You got a normal looking bird, a normal looking pig, even a regular old donkey. There's many similar, apparently Earth-like animals throughout the games. There's normal fish, like tuna, 
you know, or goldfish. Crickets, worms, and frogs are all items you can collect. You can hear seagulls, which sound like normal seagulls, in the jungle and the deserted island. You can find normal-looking crayfish, snakes, butterflies, fireflies, dung beetles. The list goes on and on. Monster World elaborated on this and gave these animals their own distinction. They called it endemic life in Monster World. These creatures don't bother humans, so they aren't considered monsters. But the distinctions the ecologists use in Monster Hunter start to get mixed up when creatures like Kelby or Mosswine are introduced. Both of these are seemingly pretty normal Earth-like animals, and they also don't bother humans, but they're still titled monsters. Monster is just a general term used for the series' identity, and they aren't going to drop or rework these distinctions anytime soon. It's also a cultural thing. Every human in the Monster setting only knows these creatures as the title Monsters, and this isn't going to change anytime soon. As you progress through a Monster title, the animals you encounter get progressively more fantastical. It's like a sliding scale, and every monster fits on the sliding scale. On one end, you have Poogie, which is a completely normal Earth pig. On the other end, you have Kirin and Fatalis, which are fantastical, mythical creatures. They are a literal unicorn and a literal dragon. Those are animals we know do not exist in our real world. After the normal Earth pig, you tend to see the cat that stands on its two legs and can talk to you. The hunting notes for the feline monster have always said they resemble cats, which implies they are not actually cats. The Japanese wording actually calls them beast men. After that are the herbivore monsters. Aptanoff resembles an earth dinosaur, but not any one in particular. Kelby resemble deer, but not exactly. Bolfango are large boars, and they're even stated as large boars in the notes, which imply regular boars exist. It also says that Kelby are deer. Which, uh, does that mean that there's other kinds of deer? In most other fantasy settings, these oddities are hand-waved. The monstrous animals are described as simply evil versions of normal animals, created by evil supernatural entities, or that evil monsters simply exist for that setting. In most fantasy settings, deliberately fantastic monsters are not expected to make practical sense when compared to our real-life earth biology and ecology. They are intended to be fantastical. But Monster Hunter is different from most fantasy settings. Most of the so-called monsters don't behave like evil monsters at all. You can follow them around and experience their charming and novel daily routines. They are not out to destroy humans. They're just animals. We never see the normal deer or the normal cats. And aside from the fact that it would be a waste of resources to engineer, you know, normal deer and cats for the game, I've come to the personal conclusion and headcanon that if you don't see them in the game, then these things simply don't exist. Kelleby are the deer. Felines are the cats. The normal non-monster versions of these animals don't exist until they're visibly seen. In a sense, ironically, Monster Hunter's actual mythical creatures are normal cats. Because we never see them. But they're talked about. It's important for Monster Hunter to have animals that resemble our own. Monsters that are familiar, so that when we see the more fantastical animals, they stand out more, and present themselves more as an actual visual threat. That being said, Monster Hunter also deliberately includes monsters that aren't grounded in reality at all. When you create a world full of mythical creatures like the Kirin, the entire world starts to feel like a very fantastical place with no basis in reality. Our focus for the world of Monster Hunter was to create a place that would feel like it could be real. By tossing in a decidedly fantasy-themed creature into this realistic world, it really makes the Kirin stand out in the player's eyes, and we hope that such unexpected surprises will make the world a more exciting place for them to explore. That's why we made the decision to include creatures like the Kirin. By deliberately including this range of creatures, the player experiences a transition from realism into fantasy. The more unrealistic monsters are kept at the end to be final challenges, and the more realistic monsters are included at the start of the game suddenly feel mundane and realistic. In the same book, it was also said, Still, we did manage to put together the feline and velociprey while we were working on the larger dragons. When you're dealing with nature and the creation of a natural environment, you can't help but fill in the empty spaces with smaller critters. You can't create a full, vibrant world with just a bunch of boss monsters. The developers had always intended for these monsters to function in a simulated ecosystem with each other. They wanted the game world to feel as real as possible. That's why the monsters in Monster Hunter will drink, eat, sleep, and communicate to one another in ways real animals do. 
They aren't mindless evil monsters born from evil to destroy humanity. They are deliberately crafted animals that live and prey on each other in a fictional ecosystem. Still, Velociprey is an exaggeration of a real-life Earth animal turned into something more monstrous. You take a dromaeosaur and you exaggerate the deadliest parts of the body, the claws and the teeth. Hermitars look like normal hermit crabs, but they're as large as a human adult. These creatures resemble planet Earth creatures, but have exaggerated features to push that narrative that humanity struggles more in this world compared to our planet Earth. Then we get to monsters like the Yankaku, which resembles a bird more than a dragon. This is again purposeful, it's all part of a progressively introducing more and more fantastical animals to the player. Another example is Anjanath, which looks like a normal earth theropod dinosaur, but once it reveals its frills and its nose, it definitely looks more wyvern-like and fantastic. By slowly increasing the fantastical elements via progressively more threatening challenges, Capcom has created a unique experience where the player hunter is effectively hunting the myth, the mythical creature. They experience the process of hunting normal earth animals transitioning into the mythical creatures. No other game does this. And this is why we like it so much. Other early boss monsters like the Dromes, like Iodrome, Gendrome, use different status ailments to teach the player of the mechanics. Thematically, this is also easing the player into the dramatic, exaggerated biology that the animals of Monster Hunter carry. Poison and Venom are real-world biological weapons that animals use to hunt and protect themselves. By introducing these exaggerated biological features, the player becomes used to them as the normal in this universe's ecology. This way, when the game proceeds to introduce water, thunder, and fire-producing organs in the follow-up monsters as you start fighting more dangerous creatures, the player is better prepared to accept these things as naturally occurring biological processes that these animals happen to have. By giving the player the organs and the quest rewards, you present to the player that these things are, without a doubt, simply a biological process. Eventually, you face Rathalos, which by all accounts would be viewed as a fantastical, you know, red dragon. Except it's not, because the game has taught you by now that there's always going to be something more fantastical to surpass it. And that these monsters, no matter how monstrous they appear, are just animals that live in this setting. On the Rathalos quest in Monster Hunter 1, or actually any of the Gen 1 games, when you, when you first see Rathalos, it's hunting an Aptonoth and it's eating it. It's not destroying a village. It's not terrorizing people, it's simply behaving like a normal animal. If you take away Rathalos's fire breath and give him feathers instead of scales, suddenly he's just a giant hawk, which is not too far out there compared to a real-life planet Earth. I mean, hawks aren't giant, but he behaves like a hawk. Rathalos eventually is surpassed by the Monoceros wyvern, Monoblos, which is far more fantastic than Rathalos. Monoblos can dig and swim through dense sand effortlessly, it can fly, even though it doesn't need to fly, it's incredibly armored, even though it appears to have no predators, and they literally, like, like they literally just taped a Styracosaurus head onto a dragon and made it the ruler of the desert. None of these things line up at all, yet you don't question it, and you buy it as the next challenge and logical progression to surpass Rathalos, because of the way that this game introduces these monsters to you. Of course, Monoblos is followed by Gravios, which seems even more of a progression into fantasy. Instead of just breathing fire, it shoots a fire beam, which looks like a sci-fi weapon or just straight magic. Again, with everything else you've seen in this game up until now, there is a through line. Most would reasonably say, well, this makes sense. This is just the logical conclusion to the previous animals up until this point. And then we accept this animal and its fantasy weapon laser beam as an evolution of the previous animals. Finally, all those creatures are surpassed by the Elder Dragons, which I'll elaborate more on soon. They are far more powerful, and they're far more fantastical, and they're far more monstrous. Which is why every game ends with you slaying the Elder Dragons, you hunt the myth. This is the pinnacle of what that sliding scale was leading to. Here's what I take away from all this. Monster Hunter's setting mimics a classical period of human history, but unlike our real world, the manticores and unicorns and dragons are actually real, and it's affected our society to its core. Monster Hunter makes the player hunter encounter animals that resemble real-life Earth animals that progressively get more fantastical with each encounter. Eventually, by the end of the game, they become so fantastical that they can no longer be compared to normal, real-life animals. In doing so, the fantastical animals fit in alongside the less fantastical ones as believable animals within this setting. 
In Monster Hunter 1, we had the Kezu, which we reasonably deduce uses the thunder element like an electric eel. It used it to paralyze prey through the water and the caves it resides in. Since its habitat does not require the need to see because it's in caves, it's blind and sluggish. Its attacks reflect its biology, and it probably thinks that the player is food and is just trying to paralyze and eat the hunter. The other animal that creates lightning in Monster Hunter 1 is the Thunder Bug, which started as just an item but became a proper monster in Monster Hunter 2. With both of these monsters, the franchise established that insects can create electricity and that some animals use electricity in damp environments similar to an electric eel. Monster Hunter 3 brings Legiacris, which uses electricity similar to Kezu, albeit with more explosive grandeur. Primarily uses it underwater or in wet areas, and that makes sense because it would be more effective underwater, like an electric eel. Monster Hunter Portable 3rd brings Zynogre, which relies on Thunderbugs to give it its thunder powers. This is cool because it builds off of what we already know. Again, it's all part of this through line. You're taught, oh, Thunderbugs create thunder. Zynogre uses the Thunderbugs to create thunder. Okay. Obviously, they don't always follow through with this, and I have- this is like one of my big criticism of like a lot of uh, newer subspecies. Like, Portable 3rd introduces Crimson Kirapeko and Baleful Giganox, uh, and these alongside, you know, like Fulgur Anginath are simply video game bosses needing a new ability to be new video game bosses. Baleful Giganox I can excuse because it's related to Kezu, and the two simply have thunder abilities, so I just hand wave that as, okay, it's fine. But Crimson Kirapeko just creates electricity with its hands, somehow, and somehow Fulgur Anginath came to be, but both of the animals have a base form that have no biological need for those lightning abilities, and fire they already had, which was just as effective, whatever. Monster Hunter Generations introduced Astalos, which I was able to hand wave that and say it's fine, it's like Thunderbug, because it's bug-like, it's like a bug, so it creates lightning somehow, because bugs create lightning in this world. Finally, Monster Hunter World introduces Toby Kodachi, which creates electricity through static buildup, which is somewhat reasonable, actually. With the exception of Thunderbugs, and by extension, Zynogre and Astalos, the other animals that use Thunder, Kezu, Lagaikris, Toby Kodachi, have real-world equivalents that ground the monster in some kind of relatable sense, so they don't seem too fantastical. Furthermore, it is actually a rather rare phenomenon in Monster Hunter to begin with, conducting electricity. It's not seen in many lower-tier monsters at all, because lightning is a fantastical ability to begin with. I'm sure a few of you may even agree that it's more fantastical than generating fire, and I think that the developers are Capcom intended it to be this way in these games, with poison and paralysis being the first ailments you encounter, then water, fire, and sleep typically being mid-tier, and then finally ice, thunder, and dragon being used more by the strongest monsters. And again, I believe this is all deliberate, so the player is slowly encountering more fantastical things as they continue through their journey, getting closer and closer to true mythical beasts. Which of course brings me to the Elder Dragons. As I said previously, on the sliding scale of normal monster to fantastical mythical monster, the Elder Dragon are the most furthest on the end of monster, like they are monster. Now I'm gonna quote a book that was written in 77 AD. The fiercest animal is the unicorn, which in the rest of the body resembles a horse, but in the head a stag, in the feet an elephant, and the tail a boar, and has a deep bellow, and a single black horn, two cubits long, projecting from the middle of the forehead. They say that it is impossible to capture this animal alive. I think that when people think of a unicorn, they think of a pretty white horse with a horn. Though there are actually many different descriptions of what a unicorn is supposed to look like. The description I listed just now uh, is, was probably actually for a rhinoceros, but they just didn't understand that. When you, when you word it like that, it comes close to what Kieran in Monster Hunter resembles. Because it does resemble a horse, but it its toes are more like that of an elephant. It doesn't have hooves like a horse. It has a tail closer to that of a boar, and its head actually resembles a deer more so than a horse. If you played Monster Hunter 1, then you know that Kieran is set up to be a hunt that's pretty rare. Arguably as rare as the Fatalis. There are forum posts from 2004 players debating if Kieran even exists. After facing all the other monsters that could be passed off as semi-realistic, you're greeted with the true fantasy beasts at the end of these games. The dragons, the manticores, and even a unicorn. There was another thunder animal that I missed out, and that's of course Monster Hunter 2's Rajang which is a minotaur, and it eats the Kirin, and that's how we figured out it has its lightning-based powers. Zynogre uses thunderbugs, Rajang uses the horns of Kirin. So even though it's not an Elder Dragon, because it eats Elder Dragons, it's 
mystical powers can be explained, can be rooted back to that. But frankly, the game no longer needs to provide an explanation on how these animals have their powers. Elder dragons are mysterious, mythical animals, and their powers don't need to be explained. The elder dragons are the most fantastical of the animals in the world of Monster Hunter. And despite this, I believe they still remain a reflection of real-life planet Earth. Except, instead of being based on real animals, the elder dragons are inspired by real-world natural disaster and phenomena. But they're dressed in the imagery of mythical creatures from cultures around the world. So again, these things still have basis in reality, even if they don't have basis in natural ecology. Kirin represents a thunderstorm, but they're dressed as a fusion of the European unicorn and the Asian Kirin. Teostra represents a forest fire, but it's inspired by the mythical manticore. It may not have a scorpion tail, but the shaping resembles that of a segmented scorpion tail. The Tibetan depictions of dragons are associated with storms and clouds. It makes sense that Cachella Diora would be modeled after these depictions. Seeing as you face Cachella Diora on mountains that resemble the Himalayas, often these cultures saw the storms as the work of divine creatures, like dragons. As we described before, Monster Hunter takes the myth and makes it reality. The storm dragon is real, and it is the cause of the storm. In my opinion, Monster Hunter 2's soundtrack is where Monster Hunter began to find its voice. I think I've said this before. Cachella Diora's theme is a great example of this. Upon first listen, it sounds very cinematic. The Brass and Strings performance is both haunting and heroic, establishing a battle between a mortal man and a living storm. It's important to note here that despite the western sounding performance, the composition is accented by Central Asian percussion. Monster 1 focused on a European aesthetic for the instrumental choice for the most part, uh, to match the more European monsters. I mean, there's straight up unicorns and red and black dragons in Monster 1. However, Monster 2 focused more on Asia, with the locales being more Asian inspired. Many of the creatures you encounter are from Asian or Middle Eastern mythologies instead, so you get a Greek minotaur, Persian manticore, and now a Tibetan dragon. Listening again to Cachella Dora's theme, you can hear the Asian instrumentation. It's just subtle, and I think most people don't pick up on it. Fighting it in a mountain range gives the vibes of hunting a Tibetan dragon in the Himalayas, which is exactly what I believe the game wants you to experience. And this is exactly what makes Monster Hunter such a special experience. No other game setting permits such a fantastical and exhilarating experience as being a normal human mortal facing a mythical creature. And only through the buildup of all those other animals, the normal animals that get more and more monstrous, does the player gain the experience and capabilities to match a monster as mythical as a Tibetan storm dragon. For Monster 2's vocal performances, Capcom hired Ikuko Noguchi to be the in-universe singer. I know I said her name horrible and I'm very sorry. Anyway, the outcome was spectacular. Her performances create such a distinctly unique sound to the world of Monster Hunter. It helped give it its voice, as I said before. Once again, these songs are intended to be diegetic. They're meant to be actual songs performed in the setting of Monster Hunter, because that's what's literally happening. There's a person literally singing those songs in the world of Monster Hunter for your Hunter character to listen to. The lyrics of these songs are significant, because they illustrate the culture of the people in Monster Hunter. Her songs in third generation are associated with Cedius, which is the main threat to Moga Village. Cedius being an underwater whale dragon is representative of an underwater earthquake. The village is undergoing frequent earthquakes and likely tsunamis. 
and dealing with these disasters is otherwise difficult. In the real world, humans are at the mercy of such events, and would be required to move, or at least rebuild, after destruction from an earthquake or tsunami. In Monster Hunter, the player is given the opportunity to destroy the earthquake itself by slaying the Elder Dragon. This opportunity is only possible within the Monster Hunter game world. Monster Hunter, in a way, appears as the ultimate power fantasy. Humans are given the opportunity to stop nature itself by killing it. To grant ourselves supreme control over the Earth, we physically fight the Earth itself. The journey that the player hunter undertakes through the game is a reflection of humanity's progressive domination over nature through advancement of technology and technique. We struggle with early level equipment to ultimately end with powerful weapons and armor skills that completely destroy the end game Elder Dragons. We have to remind ourselves, however, that the game itself already spells out how this story will end. The implementations to defeat Elder Dragons were already present in the underwater ruins you face Cedius in which implies that at some point, long before you, an ancient culture also faced and likely defeated the Elder Dragon Cedius. Yet these people are gone. Despite all their advancements to defeat Elder Dragons, they died out. Eventually the Earth overtook them. So Monster Hunter isn't a power fantasy to overcome nature. It's a reminder that even if we try, nature will eventually bite back stronger which is why there's always another stronger Elder Dragon. Humanity wishes to completely overcome our own reality and become our own god, yet we will always face a new, previously unknown, roadblock we were unprepared for. We've taken to use the term Elder Dragon for any creature that defies ordinary classification. But I suppose you could call them a type of phenomenon. Disasters, cataclysm, living, breathing forces of nature. Elder dragons don't just represent natural disasters, rather they represent nature itself, the will of the universe. The elder dragons are God. If an elder dragon functioned in the ecosystem like a normal animal, they would completely overtake the world and destroy everything else in their path. Elder dragons are perfect life forms. Their mere existence would cause an ecological arms race where every other creature would be forced to keep up with the elder dragons or perish. Elder dragons shape the environment around them like humans do. And not because they're consciously uncomfortable, at least that's what we think, but rather I think it's because they represent nature itself. They represent how nature, or God, forged the Earth as we know it, and in this sense, the Elder Dragons are God. As animals, they cannot reasonably exist, it is impossible because they would completely dominate the Earth. Instead, they are the epitome of Monster Hunter's message, they are the thematic, narrative device that concludes the story of Monster Hunter. The final opposition against those that wish to be God is God itself. In this way, the Elder Dragons and all their mystery are meant to be unexplainable, nebulous, and symbolic. They are the narrative device that concludes Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter World ends with a fight against the Fatalis, which even the name Fatalis is not the name of the monster, but rather the name of the phenomenon. The game ends with the player facing an incarnation of chaos and destruction. Fatalis is expressed as an entity that works to destroy humanity. This goes beyond nature, and now this is suddenly entering a philosophical and moral idea. For once, a monster is classified as truly evil, as anti-human. It's in every way representative of the devil itself. Now, I'm not an expert on theology, so I'm not going to spend much time unpacking what it all could represent, because we could be here a long time pondering this message about what Monster is trying to tell, but with those with basic knowledge might get confused on how, if Elder Dragons represent God, then how can Fatalis, an Elder Dragon, be representative of an entity that supposedly defies God? Of course, I know that there's going to be those that actually do understand what I'm getting at here, and that would know that these things are far more complex than that.
I believe rather that these are all metaphorical entities coming together in a message of balance. It's not simply good or evil, it's the universe itself is fighting back against humanity and that this struggle is universal. I've explained it before, a thousand times before, the tower in Monster Hunter 2. Yeah, yeah, it's a Tower of Babel metaphor. It was probably made out of Cachella Diora bodies. I'm pretty dead set on that being the case. And despite being the pinnacle of human civilization and a clear defiance of God, of nature, of the universe, it's ultimately reduced to just ancient ruins with no humans in it. Now the tower is overtaken by the Elder Dragons, like the Fatalis. The Ancestor Fatalis is widely considered the most powerful monster in the series. It's representative of all of creation. I think this Fatalis is the answer to the conundrum I discussed previously. The Fatalis is an event. It represents a great cosmic force of nature, the will of the universe. Where in some cases the Fatalis is seen as a destroyer, it can also be seen as a creator, the origin of life. Sometimes it's depicted as a demon, but sometimes it's depicted wise and bearded. Regardless, the Fatalis is the balance of the universe, it is the event that defines the world, whether through creation or destruction. Humanity struggles to comprehend that the universe exists with or without them. It's easier for us to associate creation as good and destruction as evil, as these things affect our livelihoods. But ultimately, after all is said and done, we don't need to exist for the universe to exist. And I believe Monster Hunter is a reminder of that. If sin is the defiance of God, then humanity's desire to reshape the world could be considered defiance of original creation. Would that be sin? Everything that we do to make ourselves comfortable. The Fatalis is a reminder that we are as much a destroyer as we are a creator. The Fatalis resembles the devil, but we can't forget that the devil is within us too, and it's up to us to make the right choices. If our ultimate goal is to overcome the universe and become our own god, then we should do it right, however that may be. That is not a question I can answer. Monsters are the opposition to our will. Our hubris blinds us in our effort to destroy them, Rarely do we reflect on ourselves. Unfortunately, we must face nature in order for our will to survive. That is the most universal human experience. And that's what I mean when I say Monster Hunter is about hunting monsters. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters. Um, like, it, it means everything to me. I'm so sorry this video has taken me so long. I planned to make this video two years ago. I couldn't figure out the words. Eventually I did. I also promised the Monster Hunter like, World and Rise music discussion video, like the 5th gen music discussion video. I ended up using a lot of the notes from that in this video. The 5th gen music discussion video will probably be in the world video that I'm still writing, but all these things take time, and it's because I don't want to produce something that is a waste of your time. I want to produce videos that are strong, that mean something, are impactful, and uh, make you rethink what Monster Hunter is really about. That's what I really care about, because this series means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to a lot of people. This is a long video, and, but thank you so much for watching. Hopefully it'll be easy to put together and edit. <sighs> thank you all. Alright, see ya. Bye!